Um, we're delighted to have this opportunity to talk with you. Um, how about those tax cuts? <laughs> how about them? I'm going to go to the New York Times, no doubt your favorite publication. Um, but their polling that they've commissioned themselves seems to indicate that compared to a favorability rating of 37% when the tax cuts were passed across the whole nation, Democrat, Republican, Independent, it's now risen to 51%. So more than half of the nation now think it was a good idea. Has this surprised you that it's the numbers move no, that way? Not, not at all. If anything, it surprised me where the numbers were originally. But let me just give you a, a quick overview of really what we were trying to accomplish and why it was so important to the president that we do this. So the first part was on the business tax system. We had one of the highest corporate rates in the world. We taxed on worldwide income, but we had this crazy concept of deferral that if our companies left their money offshore, they didn't have to pay taxes. So it encouraged companies like Apple to leave hundreds of billions of dollars offshore. So the first part of the tax plan was about making a competitive business tax rate. We lowered the corporate rate to 21%. We lowered the rate for pass-throughs in small businesses to a level it hasn't been since the 1930s. And we went from a worldwide system to a territorial system, taxing people on money that they make here. And the second aspect of it was the president felt very strongly we wanted to have a middle income tax cut, give people back more of their money so that they could spend it, save it, and stimulate the economy. So th that's, that's really what it's been about. Uh, there's been some talk of a, a do-over or at least a look at some of the details that may need to be corrected, uh, a second look, some international provisions in particular. Do you have any plans to tinker with it? You know, there's, uh, first of all, there's 80 aspects of the tax bill that are left to me, the secretary, but it's obviously really my entire team, to write regulations and definitions and everything else. So our, our most important thing is this changes everything at the IRS, from the systems to the call centers to the technology to the forms. So our number one focus is implementation. You could think of this as this is the largest project management thing I've ever overseen and one of the largest uh, in, in the United States. That's the major part of it. There's a lot we can do by regulation. There are some technical corrections that we're going to need to do that were just, uh, you know, what I would say effectively the equivalent of typos that need to be corrected. Not changes in policy where the drafting didn't end up with what Congress intended to do. So a couple of billion dollars here, a couple of billion dollars here. No, it's really, it's really less, it's less about the money, but I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. For farmers, there are certain incentives, and when we did the bill, we wanted to make sure if you were a farmer and you sold through a co-op, that you got the same incentives that you sold direct. So we paid all this attention to making sure the language had on co-ops, and then what Congress realized is that they didn't fix the language so you could sell direct. So again, it's making sure that we put in this case, farmers on a level playing field, no matter how they're selling into the market. So I'd say these, these are highly technical things. It's not about impacting money. It's about making sure that the law is, is documented correctly. How do you feel about the selling of the tax cuts? So the Tax Policy Center in DC, which is a nonpartisan independent uh, institution, they have found that about one third, only one third of Americans believe they will get a tax cut. But their analysis, when they crunch the numbers, seems to indicate that about 80% of Americans will see some form of tax cut. What's the disparity there, and how can you rectify that? Look, there, there, were, there were a lot of negative ads. There were a lot of negative things on TV while we were doing this. There were a lot of people saying why we shouldn't do it. I think what you're seeing is, now that the average American begins to see how it impacts them, uh, the polling changes. So, for example, one of our first priorities at Treasury working with the IRS was making sure we got withholding changed on February so that Americans, over 80% over of Americans, will see changes to their withholding taxes and will get back money. Um, the other thing, and we've been very, very, really pleased and proud of the response of companies, over four and a half million workers have now received special bonuses of $1,000 or more, where companies have recognized the impact of this and given people one-time bonuses and raised minimum wage. So whether it's 
uh, Walmart, which is obviously the larger, largest employer. You know, there's, there's hundreds of companies now that have responded positively. Now, uh, it's no secret to you that the yield on the 10-year treasuries is at four-year highs. Um, there are clearly anxieties in the markets that deficit spending is going to get us into trouble. How are we going to pay back our debts? Uh, 1.5 trillion potentially cost in, in the tax cuts, another 300 billion that was um, committed in the, in the recent deficit spending agreement in, in Congress. I understand the argument, if we grow the economy faster, we can pay for it. How confident can we be that our economy will continue to grow and will grow faster than it's growing now to pay for these cuts? Did you have that written down or did you steal that from the high school kids? And the, the, these high school they, kids they brief the, me. They, yeah. they asked the same question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a multi-part question, so let me just try yeah. to dissect it and, and answer a few parts of it. Um, part number one on the national debt, the debt went from 10 trillion to 20 trillion in the last eight years. Um, that, that is a significant concern to the president and me. A lot of that money was spent in the Middle East on wars that perhaps we shouldn't have been in. So, you know, the increase in the national debt is definitely something we're going to need to address over time. The cost of the tax deal, so um, because we did this through budget reconciliation, you have to score it. We scored it on what we call a static basis, which is a trillion and a half dollars with no change in behavior. Well, 500 billion of the trillion and a half were things that were the difference between what we call the policy and the baseline. Again, this is very technical government stuff, but the difference is tax extender bills that get rolled over. So the real difference was a trillion dollars, not a trillion and a half dollars. And uh, you know, we think there'll be an extra 90 basis points of growth in GDP. We think we'll create over $2 trillion of revenues. But the break even is about 35 basis points. So I'm very comfortable uh, in that. The last piece that you mentioned was the $300 billion of additional spending, which again, having nothing to do with taxes. We just passed a bipartisan bill to keep the government open and spend money. The president felt very strongly that we needed to make a major investment in the military because of the sequester caps and given everything that's going on in the world right now, and there are a lot of complicated issues that we needed to have the military invested properly. And the cost of doing that was uh, increasing non-defense spending as well. I think if it had been up to the president alone, we would not have seen the same type of increases in non-defense. So again, th these are issues we're gonna have to deal with over time. But it is clear the markets are concerned they see a lack of fiscal discipline. Uh, they see a budget, JP Morgan is predicting a budget deficit is up to 5.4% of GDP next year. Um, these are not good figures. Uh, the markets speak for themselves. How can we reassure uh, you? Actually, markets? I would I would, I would debate that. I don't, I, I don't think the markets are concerned. If anything, I would say the markets have absorbed the numbers incredibly well as it relates to the debt markets. Um, interest rates have gone up somewhat, but that's really not because of the size of the funding. That's really in anticipation of growth and what's happened with the tax deal. I think if you look at the stock market, you know, despite the fact we had a, a correction, you know, that's because we had one of the all-time great rallies. I mean, we were up close to 40% since the election. So the fact that we had a 10% correction and all the markets worked perfectly, circuit breakers didn't even have to go in, I, I think that actually was healthy. So if anything, I would say, you know, the markets are very, very favorable to all these policies. We're still going to have to pay for this debt. Well, we're still going to have to pay. Interest rates go up, it's going to get harder. Right? Uh, again, what I would just comment, we inherited this debt. So as I said. But you're not we, drawing it down. You're getting it bigger. No. I mean, it, it, again, if you believe our numbers, okay, the tax plan will not only pay for itself, but will pay down the debt. H having said that, nothing to do with the tax plan. There are government deficits and government spending. This is controlled on a bipartisan basis. And these issues are going to need to be dealt with over time. Now, over time, when we look forward, clearly our population is getting older. Uh, the drawdown on Social Security, on health care is increasing. Do you have plans for some form of entitlement reform? 
because the growth rates right now just don't make sense in terms of the, the president is not interested right now and any changes to social security um, that's not something uh, i is managing trustee of the social security trust fund that's one of my big titles i inherited in this job uh, we're focused our number one focus is creating economic growth the single most important thing we can do to help all these issues and deal with these issues when I got this job, everyone basically said, the U.S. market is going to be a 2% GDP. We can never get back to 3% GDP. There's structural issues. There's issues of the size. There's productivity issues. There's aging of the population. Um, we said we want to have policies that will get to 3%. 2% is not good enough. And we're well on our way. We've had uh, over two quarters of 3% GDP. And we're focused on policies that will lead to sustained growth. So let's talk about those policies. Clearly, tax reform has helped corporate America. What other policies do you have in mind to improve our competitiveness, our corporate competitiveness? In the sure. States? So I mean, again, I would say fixing the corporate tax system. That was a big component of it. Making sure that for small and medium-sized businesses that aren't corporations, that are partnerships, LLCs, pass-throughs, they have competitive tax rates. Again lowest tax rate since the 1930s, um, making sure the middle income has a tax cut so they have a fair amount of their money they can save and invest back, and then regulations. I mean, I, you know, I've operated a bank for the last nine years. We were regulated by the FDIC, the OCC, the Consumer Protection Bureau, and the Fed. I'm a big believer in regulations. You want to take FDIC deposits, you should be regulated. Having said that, there's a lot we've learned since the financial crisis. And we should have proper regulations, not overlapping regulations. So that's a big focus. And then the third focus of the president is really trade deals. And the president absolutely believes in free trade. He's uh, one of the greatest free traders. But we don't have free trade with many countries. We want to make sure we have reciprocal trade. We want to make sure that U.S. companies have the same opportunity to do business in China that Chinese companies have here. So dealing with trade deficits and, and, and being, uh, thank you. He, he's the salesman in chief for US workers and US companies. So let's talk about China. You went there. Um, China has an enormous trade surplus with us. Uh, what can we do? Well, we, we think of it as a deficit. The, you, you, from their perspective, China has surplus. a surplus. Yeah. Yes. We it, have a deficit. Yes, exactly. What can we do to work at that? Uh, we're having very active discussions while, while we speak. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I, I would just make a couple of comments. One, uh, on the good news front, I think President Xi and President Trump have the best relationship of any two presidents uh, in the history of the two countries, including Nixon. They speak regularly. They have very frank discussions. We are having very direct discussions at all levels. I think, you know, China's been very helpful with us in North Korea and what we're trying to do with getting rid of nuclear weapons on the peninsula. They've been critical to helping us uh, at the UN. Uh, so we're having lots of dialogue. But since the first meeting at Mar-a-Lago, the president has made it very clear to President Xi that trade deficit has to come down. But it's not. Not yet. We're only one year in, I might add. <laughs> and we have Can't Chairman do everything for life. in the first year. We have Chairman for Life Xi Jinping, who will probably outlast the next three or four presidents in this country. Um, North Korea? Yes. Seeing as you talked about North Korea, one, the new sanctions you just announced on specific ships, uh, it's getting pretty granular now. Um, are you confident that we have some leverage on them now? Uh, do you think that their offer to talk is a response to our sanctions? Do you see that pressure strategy working? So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, there are certain aspects of this job I came in uh, with a, a lot of experience on, even though I didn't have government experience. Uh, I had domestic finance experience, international finance. What I knew nothing about was sanctions. And what most people don't realize is at Treasury, we manage all the sanctions programs. I probably spent half my time on sanctions. So when I got to Washington a little over a year ago, you know, I only knew about the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, from what I read in the papers. 
Uh, we have an incredible team of people at Treasury, and I sit on the National Security Council because sanctions are critical to everything we're doing. So whether it's Iran, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Russia or Venezuela, sanctions are at the center of our foreign policy, and they work. So there's no question in Iran, when we had unified sanctions on Iran, the only reason they came to the table to negotiate the Iran nuclear deal was because of sanctions. Um, the president thinks, which I fully agree with, we could have had a better deal. He's not happy with the term of the deal. He's not happy with the fact that they're doing ballistic missiles outside of the deal, but the sanctions work. In the case of North Korea, we now have 500 sanctions on North Korea. We put in since 2005. Half of them we've put in in the last year. Friday, I was at the White House. We announced 60 sanctions, very granular, as you said, dealing with ship-to-ship -ship illegal transfers of coal and petroleum. So we've now sanctioned individual ships that can't go into ports to lock this down. So whether it's the banking system, whether it's the shipping system, we are determined to use sanctions. Uh, we're early on in this, but uh, again, what I can tell you is we are seeing the impact on that in what it's doing to their economy and their ability to get uh, access to things that they need for their military. Will your staff brief you on the state of the world economy? What color picture are they presenting these days? Pretty rosy, I would imagine? Um, you know, again, I'd say, you know, our primary focus is the U.S. economy. As I've said, if the U.S. economy grows, that's good for the rest of the world. Um, you know, I, I think our projections are pretty positive. Again, I think we'll, we'll have, we could have a couple of big quarters of GDP. Um, substantially high. I mean, you know, at one point the Atlantic Fed was predicting 5%. I'm not sure we're going to get there for a quarter or two, but I do feel we feel comfortable with 3% sustained GDP. And as I look around the rest of the world, um, Europe is not growing nearly as fast as we are, but their economy is, is doing much better than it's done in the past. A lot of people were concerned about Brexit and the impact on the UK. Again, I think this is something we're carefully monitoring. Um, so I, I think we're comfortable, you know, having said that, uh, look, things always occur when you least likely expect them. Indeed. Are you comfortable where the dollar is compared to other currencies? <laughs> nice try. <laughs> so uh, my dollar comments have been taking a, a little bit out of context. So first of all, I don't comment on where the dollar is in the short term, okay? Um, you know, no different than we believe in Fed independence. We believe in the dollar is a free market. It's one of the most liquid markets in the world, and we don't set policy to impact the dollar. If anything, interest rates probably have a bigger impact on the dollar than anything else, which is the Fed and not us. Having said that, uh, my comments in Davos got taken a bit out of uh, at a place, and I was on TV for 24 hours talking about a weak dollar. That was not the case. Um, I fundamentally believe in the long term, a strong dollar is good for the U.S. and is a sign of the U.S. economy and the reserve currency. Where the dollar is in the short term is, is not something I'm terribly concerned about one way or another and has different impacts on different parts of the economy. You mentioned interest rates. Uh, the question of inflation comes up. Um, I was just chatting with somebody just before we had this, uh, this meeting with, he's in the food service industry, he says he's getting calls from his suppliers every week indicating prices, They're, they want to raise their prices. Uh, I know that Jay Powell is going to be talking about this in the coming days, but what's your sense of, of inflationary pressure in our economy now as we continue to grow? Well, that I can talk about, and I have a few views on. Um, let me first say, you know, although I didn't have government experience, the single best thing that prepared me for this job was I traveled with the president all around the country as his finance chairman. I met with literally thousands and thousands of workers, small business owners, big business owners. Um, I fundamentally have lived in L.A. and New York. Let me tell you from traveling the country, L.A. and New York is not the rest of the, of the United States. So. One of the problems of the last eight years, and one of the reasons why the president won this election, was he understood that the average American had no wage increase in the last eight years. Financial markets were great, 
for people in this room, it's been a great economy, the average worker didn't have the right opportunities. So a lot of our tax plan is designed to create increases for workers. And a matter of fact, we've talked about, we think the average worker will get $4,500 in increase as a result of this. We've seen over four and a half million individuals receive special bonuses from companies as a result of this. So we want some wage inflation. Um, I'm comfortable, we'll see. I think we'll get some wage inflation without a crossing over into general concerns of inflation. One of the good news is, you know, the U.S. Is, 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 has a very different level of energy independence than it did 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. So when you used to really think about risk to the U.S. economy, it was energy inflation and, and, and what did that do? So I think we can be in a period of time where, again, a little bit of inflation is a good thing. The Fed targets a little bit of inflation. The fact interest rates have gone up is a function of people's confidence in the economy growing. And we'll see. Uh, you know, I respect the Fed's independence, but I think they'll probably do a good job of, of, of managing these issues. The market dropped 1,175 points on February 5th, the biggest ever point drop. Um, it's since recovered somewhat, but uh, shortly afterwards, you pointed to the involvement of algorithmic trading, um, which is computer generated, no human even touches, um, and very, done very quickly. Is there a case to be made for some regulatory oversight of this algorithmic trading, which? Well, there, there are, I mean, there, there's, there is already a lot of regulatory oversight in the market, and I think the good news is, look, the market dropped again, a lot in points, not as much in percentage as some of the things we've had. Markets function perfectly. There's circuit breakers. Very few circuit breakers were triggered. Um, I called the major banks the next morning. Absolutely no settlement problems, no liquidity problems, very orderly. And, and I would just say again, you know, I don't comment on what the market is on the short term, but you know, the market was up over close to 40% since the election in an incredible rally. To, to a certain extent, a little bit of a correction was probably a good thing, but I think the bigger issue was the fact you could have a correction of that size and very little impact in general. Um, but there's no question the advent of electronic trading does make it when markets move, they move faster and, and, and tend to move more. Let me dig deeper into this digital world. Bitcoin, you have pointed to the role that Bitcoin plays in financing terrorist groups, in particular ISIS. And of course, the great advantage for them is it's untraceable, it's confidential, they can pay for stuff in one country and withdraw in another country. Um, it seems to me, and you suggested that maybe there should be some effort to limit this, that argument is hard to refute. Who wants ISIS having free access to free cash? The question is how one would do that in this highly unregulated world. Sure. Well, um, one of my roles is, is secretary I play as I chair what's called FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council. And what I do with that is I convene all the financial regulators. Uh, I don't have the right to tell them what to do, but I have the right to convene them. And uh, it, it's an area where we talk about a, a lot of important issues. And we have set up a specific subcommittee to look at uh, cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is obviously the biggest. Uh, you know, for those of you who, who don't follow these things, I mean, it literally went from 1,000 to 20,000, I think back down to 6,000, back now around 10,000. I mean, th this is obviously one of the most volatile investments you've ever seen. I, I don't think you can call it a currency, although it's a, it, it, it has certain aspects of a currency. Um, people have talked about digital currency and should you have digital dollars and digital euros and I can come back to that in a minute. But uh, the technology is very important of distributed ledgers. In the United States, if you want to trade Bitcoin, anybody who's attached to the Bitcoin network, if you're a dealer, if you're a wallet, you're subject to the same rules as a US bank for money laundering, know your customer, BSA, Bank Secrecy Act. So we can monitor US institutions trading uh, of, of, of Bitcoin. We now have a futures market where, again, 
There's things that can be monitored around the, order, the ordinary trading. Our concern is there are other areas of the world where you can't monitor anything. And it, and it is the equivalent of an old Swiss numbered bank account. And this is something that we are very focused on working with the G20. Um, there's a lot of agreement on this that we need to be able to make sure that all the different major countries can monitor these transactions so that it's just not used for illicit transactions of, of bad guys. So that, that's something we're very focused on. Speaking of illicit transactions, and given that we're in California, you've talked about whether we should bank marijuana sales. At the moment, people who sell marijuana, they can't put in the bank, it's all cash. Uh, do you see a, a move there where we would basically legitimize this, even though it's still against federal law? Again, this is uh, what, what you realize when you're in government, you know, there are a series of issues that are very complicated issues. This is a complicated issue. So you start with the issue of, you know, federal laws versus state laws. Um, you know, this is something that needs to be figured out, okay? Uh, Sessions removed kind of certain instructions that had been, had been given on the state and their, their issue of prosecuting. So again, it's a complicated issue where you have, uh, you have activities that are against federal law but are subject to state law. Again, I'm not gonna comment how that gets figured out because that is out of my lane. The issue of what do banks do? So again, within Treasury, we have an area called FinCEN, which does give guidelines to the banks. Um, this is something we're trying to figure out, what do banks do? Because you know, from the IRS standpoint, we literally have companies who walk in with bags and bags and bags of cash um, to pay their taxes. Uh, obviously, we want to be paid the taxes if this business is going to be done in California. Putting on my federal hat, we obviously want to collect our federal taxes. It's a complicated issue, and I'm working with the Attorney General on this and, and contemplating what guidelines we give banks. Um, I'll open up for questions in a minute. Let me just ask one more. Um, so you were at Goldman, uh, then you were running One West Bank. Uh, that sold in 2015 for $3.4 billion, not shabby. You now run a, essentially run an $18 trillion business. How's that working out? Uh, so far, so good. <laughs> it, 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 it is interesting, though. You know, I, I consider myself lucky in that I, I've had four, four careers, really. Um, my first career was working at Goldman Sachs. It was great training. Um, I was in the trading markets. I understood risk taking. I then worked in the technology division. I became the firm's CIO. I developed a lot of expertise in operational issues. Uh, I then set up my own investment business, so I understood investments. During the financial crisis, I bought several banks from the government. Uh, again, so I had experience in a highly regulated area. And the government, the interesting thing about the Treasury job is there's so many aspects of it. Uh, so much of it is we just operationally run big parts of the government just on a very large scale. But, uh, you know, the IRS, as I said, I'm probably spending a huge component on my time right now in this large project management. The IRS touches every single person in the United States, and we're trying to figure out how we can do that with technology, how we can do it with better service, how we can make it simpler under the tax law. 90% of America will be able to fill out their taxes on a giant postcard. So, working on simplifying things. Bad luck if you're the other 10%. Bigger. <laughs> um, we have one microphone here, and there's another one in the back there. Monica's got her hand up. So please put your hand up if you have a question, and we'll try to get to I want to recognize as as Eli Broad, who I see in the, the audience, one of the great contributors to Los Angeles. Thank you, Eli, for everything you've done. There's one over there. Connor Muldoon from Causeway Capital. So first of all, congratulations on uh, the passage of tax reform. As a global money manager, uh, we definitely appreciate a, a more uh, competitive uh, U.S. tax regime. So question, um, so how much policy coordination happens between uh, the Treasury, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the Commerce Department? And, and given your banking experience, 
what do you uh, feel that Randy Quarles and his new role of supervision at the Fed needs to prioritize when it comes to banking regulation? Sure, th th those, are, those are very good, good questions. So let me first say, um, again, you can think of this as there's kind of like two separate groups. There's the independent agencies, and then there's all the different parts of the executive branch. So first, let me just comment on the independent agencies, that, which the Fed is obviously an independent agency. The OCC is an independent agency. We can, we can have a big impact by putting people in these jobs. So I'm a big fan of Randy's. I helped recruit Randy. He was confirmed by the Senate. I have a lot of confidence in what he's done. But once we put people in these jobs, as I said, um, I can convene them. We can talk about issues. but. On a policy level, I don't coordinate a policy level with the Fed. One of the things I was able to do is the President signed an executive order for us to look at financial regulation. And within Treasury, we basically wrote a book on kind of what we would do in financial regulation. And I think a lot of the regulators uh, agree with a lot of this and they're instituting it. But so, again, let me just say, there's kind of the independent agencies. Within the executive branch, and again, one of the things that I was surprised by when I got to government, there's a massive coordination process. So whether it's, uh, whether it's state, defense, commerce, USTR for trade, the White House, the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, you'd be surprised how well we, we coordinate things. And th there's, there's a formal process before we take things to the president. You know, on, on trade, we have trade meetings literally every single week on an interagency basis. That's one at the back there. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Secretary. My question is about sanctions on Iran and where you see them going, and do you see them going as far as their central bank? Thank you. Sure. Well, I'm going to be very careful on commenting specifically as to where they're going, because we don't comment on sanctions going forward. But uh, what, what I will comment a little bit about, and the President's been very clear on this, um, the President thought that, you know, we had them on the five-yard line and the sanctions were working, and we transferred a boatload of cash to them in return for signing the JCPOA. And again, the president, although there are certain aspects of the JCPOA that are very attractive, there are some major flaws. One of them is the term. The other is it allowed Iran to continue to do ballistic missiles outside of the agreement. So. We've been very, very active in sanctioning them for things that we are allowed to sanction them outside the JCPOA. Um, again, the JCPOA was never ratified by Congress. It was, ne it was never a signed agreement or a treaty by Congress. Um, but Congress put out certain legislation. And what it happens is basically every quarter, um, the president has to sign a certification in, in regards to the JCPOA. Uh, in order for our second, primary and secondary sanctions automatically not to snap back in place to where they were before the agreement. And uh, I've been party to lots of these discussions uh, at the NSC and the Oval Office, other things. The last time, and the President has been very vocal about it, this is the last time he's given Congress and he's given our European partners, he wants a better deal. He wants to make sure that Iran never has nuclear agreements and that they stop supporting terrorism uh, around the world. So we've continued to sanction them and we will continue to do so uh, outside of the deal for now. I think Alexander in the back there. Mr. Secretary, my name is Ted Green. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, going back to your comments about having had four careers, as you know, when President Nixon resigned office, that effectively brought to an end the working life of many of his cabinet secretaries, although not all. As we gather here on February 26th, how concerned are you that if the Trump administration further implodes, that that will be career ending for you? Well, I guess you didn't, vo I, I guess you didn't vote for the president. I'm kind of assuming <laughs> that's the case. So uh, in, in all due respect, you, you think it's imploded. I think that the president, 
has signed tax reform for the first time in 30 years before it's been done. He's established great relationships with China. He has had a major impact on the Middle East. I, th I think we've accomplished a lot in the last year, but we, we won't debate that. And, uh, and, and I would just say, from my own personal standpoint, I consider it to be a great honor to be in this job every day, trying to figure out how I can do things that are good for Americans and workers and everything else. And, and I'll do that for as long as I'm in this job. And uh, I think it'll be for a long time. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, a quick question. At a recent congressional hearing, you were asked about uh, double tax treaties, and I think it was regarding the Republic of Armenia, but broadly speaking, can you uh, share with us the value of double tax treaties to the United States, and will it help address uh, the trade deficit that we have with a number of countries? Sure. Well, I mean, I'd say we, we, we have a lot of tax treaties, and, and, and the purpose of the tax treaties is to make sure that there is not double taxation and that the tax systems work fairly um, for trade and investment, and that's something we'll continue to do. I think to a large extent, the fact that we've moved from a worldwide system to a territorial system eliminates a need for a lot of that. I'm not saying all of it, but it was a much bigger issue when we taxed on, on worldwide income. So hopefully because we fixed the system, that's something that's not as big of an issue going forward. Look, we wanna make sure that other countries tax our companies fairly when they're doing business there and vice versa, that we're, we're taxing people. I, I do think a lot of the transfer tax issues also are, are, are gonna be helped in the new tax system. Over here. Okay, uh, my name is Lisa Korbatov. I'm president of the school board at Beverly Hills Unified School District. My question for you is, how are you handling malfeasance, um, corruption and waste and fraud within the government? The IRS had its own scandal before you guys got there. For instance, they're putting a subway under our only high school that's costing an extra 400 million to move it 800 feet from the public right of way. That's an example of waste. That's an example of not putting the public needs first, public safety. There are multiple examples across the country. What can you do to address it? Sure. No, look, that, that, that's, that's an important issue. And, you know, I think on every level, on the city, on the state, on the federal government, it starts with transparency of what, what are we spending money on? And then it starts with holding government officials accountable to be able to explain decisions. So, you know, we, we started what we call the Trump penny, penny plan. If we can save a penny a year every year and get rid of government waste, um, you know, there's a lot of things we're doing on, again, again, on regulations that go back to what Ronald Reagan started in his period of time. I think there's a lot of efficiencies that we can get out of the federal government and the state and, and cities have, have the same issue. In the back there, back left, yes, go ahead. Uh, once again, thank you for being here. Oh, sorry. I run a small community bank, and we've watched with great pleasure uh, your efforts and the administration's efforts to rationalize or right-size the amount of regulation on the large banks. But we're also awaiting uh, for the attention to be turned to smaller banks, the small community banks, because we've, we've heard the term too big to fail, but we're now suffering from too small to survive. And we're just waiting to get that uh, attention paid to us as well. No, like I think it's a major issue. And, and a lot of what we're doing, you know, look, I, I think the, the answer to, we have, we have too much of the assets in too few banks. And one of the problems with Dodd-Frank is it made it almost impossible for small and medium-sized and regional banks um, one of the few areas I do see of, of, of bipartisan legislation in the next few months is, is there is Dodd-Frank reform. One of the aspects is raising the level on regulation, making sure that banks like you aren't subject to the Volcker rule and things like that. You probably don't do any proprietary trading. And making sure, look, I, I think, and again, having run a regional bank, community banks, regional banks, they know how to lend. And we gotta make sure that 
you can lend to the community and you're not overwhelmed with the cost of regulation to put you out of business. So we're very focused on that. Thanks for coming today. This woman here has done the best job every single time. So why don't we let her speak? Because you, you can stand up because you've been like going crazy every time. Yeah, give, her, give her the mic. I hope I, hope I don't regret this question. <laughs> you might. It's okay. Genocide. The Rohingyas. A million Rohingyas are being murdered in Burma, and this country is not really doing anything about it that we know. And you say China is helping us in the UN. Are they helping us with genocide, or are they helping you to keep the genocide down? No Jewish person in this room can accept that there is a genocide today. Okay. A okay. million people are being murdered. Okay, well, first of all, I, I am glad we, we took your question because I do think there are these issues in many places. And whether you look at what's going on, as, as you've pointed out, as you look at what's going on in Syria today, there are many, there are many, many areas. And I, I can tell you, you know, we are redoubling our efforts all around the country. I mean, Venezuela is somewhere I'm spending a lot of time on with sanctions. There, there are real issues all around the world, and whether people are Jewish or people aren't Jewish, you know, these are issues we all need to be focused on. So thank you for asking that question. Like everybody else, thank you very much for joining us. My question relates to your experience in the corporate world versus government. And what it is is, does the conflict and anger we see in the decision-making process, the political process, do you think it improves the decisions ultimately made? And then if not, any ideas for how it could be improved? I'm sorry, what was the, does the private experience help? From your perspective, coming into government, does the conflict and anger we all see, or perceive, I think, in the decision-making process, improve the decisions that are being made? And if not, what might be done to improve that? Right, well, well, again, what I'd say, again, my, my first comment on coming to government is everybody in Washington wants everybody to think, oh, government is so complicated that, you know, ordinary business people can never figure this stuff out. And that I don't agree with. So I, I don't think not having government experience hurt me coming into the job. I surely think not having government experience actually helped the president coming into this job. Again, it, it, you look at things from a different perspective. So one, I would say most things, not all things, but 80% of the things aren't as different than people want you to believe. I'll give you one example. In business, you have constituencies. You have shareholders, you have a board, you have customers, you have suppliers, you have employees. Even if you own a business entirely, you have different constituencies that you need to manage to have a successful business. We have different constituencies. It's just, it's, it's a different, but a big part of getting things done is managing constituencies. A big part of our constituencies is the American public, making sure that we understand. Um, so that, that's one. The other part of it is I say there's just a huge component of government that's operational. It's, it's running a monstrous part of the economy, and the government is in almost everything we do. So I'm very focused on how do we simplify things, how do we make things more efficient. Um, I spend a lot of time on cybersecurity. It's something that you spend a lot of time in the private sector on, on technology, how we transform things. So. Many, many more similarities than I would have thought. Going back here. Thanks for being here. I wish I was in a room of Christian conservatives because my name is Christian Wright. <laughs> my question to you, actually I have two, is uh, if you could summarize, I think I, I caught what you were saying, and we've had historic corporate tax cuts major increase in defense spending, no entitlement cuts. How sustainable is that? Well, I again, what I'd say is there's short-term issues and there's longer-term issues. So again, our first priority was 
grow the economy. That was kind of the number one economy, and a big part of that was the tax cuts and, and the tax reform fixing the tax system. Since, you know, as I said before, you can't cut your way out of these problems. So that's, that's issue number one. Over time, we are going to have to deal with the, the debt. I, I would say, you know, I, I carry around a bunch of cards, okay? I um, actually didn't bring this card today, but one of the cards I, I normally carry around is what's the debt over GDP, what's GDP per person. If you look at a lot of these numbers, I could actually argue where, where we are from a debt standpoint is very comfortable, okay? Having said that, we have to deal with these things over time. You know, we went from 10 trillion to 20 trillion. We don't want to go to 40 trillion. So government efficiency is something we need to look at over time. Um, up on the mezzanine there. Hi. Uh, there were sanctions announced against North Korean shipping last year, and so then last week we had an announcement of new, stronger sanctions on North Korean shipping. What, uh, what's, what was missing from the, the uh, sanctions last year that, that uh, is in the sanctions now, and are, we gonna, are there going to be more sanctions? How, like, what is next? Do you go and, like, and physically stop them, or what's... What's on the table? Well, don't, don't laugh. We've talked about that. No, I'm, I'm being serious. But the answer is what was announced last year was the president signed an executive order which gave us the authorities, which we never had before. So uh, after the UN, he, he gave us the authorities to basically say anybody who trades with North Korea, we have the ability to block them from trading with us. So the specific sanctions we, we announced last week were very specific ships, shipping companies, and other things that are now blocked. So it started with high-level authorities, and now it goes down. Now, let me just explain something on sanctions, because I think people have this misconception on sanctions. To create a sanction, we have to go in through an internal legal process. We start with intelligence, so we work very closely with the intelligence agencies to make sure that we understand who's doing what. Then we have to go through a legal process of being able to build, I mean, some of these sanctions have books this big behind them where we document what's gone on to make sure that we can enforce these. It's not as simple as I decide, you know, person X is gonna be cut off from the US banking system. There are certain checks and balances that we go through. So it's a lot of work. And the answer is we have a massive team. And, and as long as North Korea is doing these things, we will put more sanctions on them. I can assure you of that. I think we have time for two more questions. So we'll take one from here and one from here. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm the CEO of a small business, a lot of other business people in the room, and read various reports that there's somewhere in the neighborhood of half a trillion dollars or so that's uncollected in taxes every year um, due to underfunding of the IRS, old technology, processes, systems, and having been in private industry and the president been in private industry, one area that I don't think any business person under invests in is their AR department uh, for collecting revenue. So is that something you guys have given thought to on a go forwards basis? Sure, so uh, again, it's, it's, it's a very, very good question and it's a complicated answer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to give you the simple answer. So. The problem is not a receivables problem. So, I mean, I, I can tell you, you know, we have a tax system in the United States that is based upon self-reporting, okay? And what I'm very focused on is how can we use technology with all this information today, where we're taking in electronic information all over to try to do as good of a job as we can if people aren't properly reporting. So the, the, the issue is not a collections problem. It's not like we have the receivables and we're not collecting them. What you're probably referring to, and is a big number, is we report what we think the tax gap is. And the tax gap is the difference between what we actually collect and based upon a lot of models what we should collect. And a lot of that is the fact that people are not reporting the proper amount of income or, or transactions or things like that. And the short version is that we do have a very good return on investment on audits, okay? So on the one hand, there are people in Congress who think, well, just throw more money at this and audit more people. It's a great return. Um, 
there's a lot of people who say, look, dealing with the IRS is not the most pleasant thing, and what we need to focus on is customer service. So what I'm focused on is how do we cut the tax gap by investing in technology, and, and where we're prioritizing the IRS funding right now is, is on technology uh, in, in the process, to both make it easier for taxpayers who are complying, and to make sure taxpayers who are not complying that we have algorithms and other things to chase them down. But it's, it's, it's a very good question, and you know, I'll be uh, testifying in the Appropriations Committee in the next couple of weeks on IRS funding again. We have last one is in the back here. Hi, my name is Cassie Hermiston Boyd. I'm with London Partners. Thank you very much for taking my question. You mentioned that President Trump is carefully monitoring the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Many can uh, draw comparisons between his rise to power and Brexit. I'd like to ask you, what type of relationship do you see between the US and the UK in the next five years in their rightful roles in the world? Thank you very much. I think the UK has been our most important ally, and I see them as continuing to be our most important ally. Um, the president has said to them, as soon as we can negotiate a trade agreement, they're at the front of the line, not the back of the line. Um, I can tell you, you know, I speak to the UK, the chancellor uh, uh, at the UK, the, at the exchequer, the finance minister on a regular basis. We talk on foreign policy issues, sanctions. We have a very close relationship with them. Um, I will say, look, we, we respect their decision to do what they wanted to do, for the people to do it. I think one of the things that was unique is they weren't in the euro. I think that made it easier for them to exit. But having said that, it's, uh, it, they're going through a complicated negotiations with the European Union. Again, we're not really involved in those, other than behind the scenes being supportive on both sides to resolve what could be financial issues that have bigger impacts on, on markets. Well, thank you all for coming. Sekhar Mnushin, thank you for sharing your thoughts with thank us. You. Thank you.